Our first panel is Strengthening Maritime Security, moderated by Rear Admiral retired Lars Saunas, former Chief of the Royal Norwegian Navy and Professor and Distinguished Fellow here at the, at the Naval War College. It's now my pleasure to welcome Rear Admiral retired Lars Saunas. Thank you. Uh, we are all excited here, and I'm especially excited for being here talking about strengthening maritime security. And, and I brought with me three fellows who will actually solve my problems I had as a commandant of the Coast Guard and the problem I had as the Chief of the Navy. So I'm excited to hear, to hear their solution. So just to frame, frame it a little, um, I'm Norwegian. Uh, so, we have different cultures, uh, and in my, in my country, we introduced uh, equal conscription for men and women in 2015. So, but even though in 2012, when I was the commandant of the Coast Guard, I had parents calling me to uh, allow their daughters to join the Coast Guard as conscripts. And I noticed a big difference. When we had about 15% women about age 19 to 20, as conscript on our Coast Guard vessel, the culture of the ship changed dramatically. Because suddenly, you were replacing 18 to 19 year old boys with a mature uh, human. <laughs> and so they were driving the culture on the ship. And, and I really saw the advancement and how much that made uh, for our mission achievement. The next step I had was manning the Navy as the chief of the Navy. And when we introduced equal conscript for men and women in 2015, our conscript boot camps went from about 15, 16% female to 40% female. That's a big change. And I think today is just a little less than 40%. But just imagine, you take the whole population of Norway um, and you can choose who you want to call in, draft, and, and call in for conscription for a year. So you're not recruiting from the lower level of society, you're recruiting the people that had your education already want to have. And you're recruiting from the whole society, man or woman. That's, a, that's really the strength. But the next thing is that 15% of these, again, are the applicant to our war colleges or academies. So these are the, the future officers and chiefs in our armed service. So in many ways, I call myself, at that stage, the culture boss. Because we needed to change our culture. And I needed to ask the women, can you help me? because I don't understand it. And then I came to a question. How do I make women take command? And I asked, the Navy is a small society in Norway, <laughs> and nearly a little club. And so I asked most of the female lieutenant commanders, commanders, do you want to take command? And to my surprise, nearly no one wanted to because family, culture, society expected uh, a more demanding task for females in Norway, and that was to maintain the society. So we had to go back and change our culture to allow women to take command. And so these three major questions that I've been mentioning to you now is actually covered by our panel today. And, and I'm so happy to welcome Captain Almont back to talk about how women can take the helm. Um, she's a, a, I would call her an operational officer from uh, destroyers. She's now an area officer at CENTCOM. You can read her um, CV or bio in the program. Uh, but she has some really exciting uh, opinions about how we can go forward. So the floor is your Captain Elmont. 
Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the War College for setting this up and for everybody um, for attending. It's great to be back. I was here last year and I told you then, or told the audience then that 30 years ago, I started my Navy career across the river at Knapps. Um, and about 15, 18 years ago, I met my husband in the gym over there. So ring still on, ring still there. So it's been a pretty good run so far. So I have a lot of good foundation and happy memories here in Newport. Um, I'm also PCSing for the second time. Every time I'm invited here, I'm in the middle of a PCS. So I have one uniform left. That's the first reason I'm wearing STVs. The second reason is I met this man at last year's forum and he looked snazzy and fast, fantastic in his STBs, and I needed to do the same thing if I was gonna sit next to him this year. Um, and I went over and told him how good he looked in his uniform, and he informed me I was sitting right there in that chair before I went over and said hello to him. Um, apparently someone wearing mohair or something ridiculous sat in that chair before me, so I walked over and told him how handsome and good he looked, and he said I looked like I had been rolling around with an alpaca. Um, <laughs> So that's the kind of panel you have before you this morning. I'm gonna put my reading glasses on, and then when I take them off, you know I've gone completely off my notes. Um, but I wanted to start with something that the Admiral said in his introductions. He talked about understanding the application of strategic planning, adapting problem-solving skills to get at the operational challenges um, of the Navy and bridging the civ mill divide. All of these things enhance national security, they enhance international cooperation, and of course they enhance your maritime security. And every single one of these operations and exercises and goals is absolutely gender ignorant. It makes no difference who or what you are. You can either contribute to them or you can let someone else do the work and stand aside. Leadership in these missions, leadership in these goals at the helm of the US Navy, um, belongs to the self-assured, it belongs to the impassioned, it belongs to the strong, and it belongs not to men and women, but to the people who want to bear the burden of leadership. And I put there on my first bullet um, of a slide I won't follow except for this first bullet, it says women in service, 248 years and counting. Margaret Corbin in 1776 was a Molly Pitcher. A mo this is where I go off, off the rail. Molly pitchers were used during the Revolutionary War. They were the wives and sisters and daughters of men who were fighting, and they would bring pitchers of water to the front lines, to the cannons, where their husbands were. And they would cool the cannons with the water, and they would clean the cannons, and they would help their husbands load the cannons. Molly pitcher, Margaret Corbin, um, was standing beside her husband when he was killed by cannon fire at the um, Battle of Washington. He was killed by the Brits. And instead of running away, instead of walking away, instead of going somewhere else, she put down her pitcher and she started loading cannons alongside his cannon mates. And she did that until the end of the war. She did that until she was taken prisoner. And she was taken prisoner after she too was hit by a cannonball. It tore off most of her jaw. It tore off her left arm. It was hanging loose. And it tore off most of her left breast. And that's when she was taken prisoner. And she stayed prisoner with the British Army for several months, and they finally released her back to the United States uh, with other prisoners. She went back to war and continued to fight on side, the, on side of the Americans. Fifteen years later, Congress decided she had been a warrior in combat, and they gave her, as the first woman ever, um, a military pension. It was half the rate of the men, but it was the first woman to ever be given a military pension by Congress. And in 1926, her remains were exhumed from an unmarked, unremarkable grave along the Hudson, and she was buried with full honors at West Point. So I tell you that story to say, we're here, we've always been here, and we're always going to be here. 1948 was a formality bringing women into combat in 1948 or allowing women to be in the military in 1948 was just a formality by Congress. Secretary Panetta in 2013 announced that women could serve in combat. That was a formality. The question is, ladies, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with the rights you have today? And how are you going to step up and lead? Not how are men going to get you there? Not how is Congress going to get you there? Not how is the Department of Defense going to get you there? But how are you going to get you there? 
two and a half centuries of inspiration to look back on, that's what you have. That's what I had to bring me up in the ranks, and that's what you have now. Actually, you have about three decades more than I had to begin with. Gentlemen, you have tens of thousands of women colleagues serving alongside you. Shipmates, company mates, whatever Space Force mates are called, you have them. <laughs> I'm not sure, I'm not, I get airmen, airmen, air people? I don't know, space, gar, gar, guardian mates? I, that's not right either. Um, most importantly, you are our mentors. Look around the room, and if you, can I see active duty ladies, reserve ladies? There ain't that many of us, so we rely on you. If you're not your own source of strength, then guess who we look to to be that source or to embolden our source of strength? It's you guys who are our mentors. I've never had a female mentor, but I've had some pretty spectacular male ones. Um, you serve beside us and you can help us lift ourselves up. That's pretty essential. What makes America successful is that you stand beside us and that women stand tall and strong with you or without you. It isn't Raytheon or Boeing or Lockheed Martin that's gonna make us successful in battle. It's the people we serve with. I was on board, um, I won't say the country, but I was on board a, um, a vessel from a very close ally of ours about 15 years ago for a conference. And I walked past the flight deck and there was a sign hanging on the flight deck Again, very strong, very powerful, very close ally of ours. There was a sign hanging on the, on the flight deck and it said, just because someone takes the initiative doesn't mean you should. And I thought, oh my God, we may go to war with these people by our side. So guess what? Friends and allies and partners are essential. I'm a foreign area officer, that's my mantra. But you, the people in this room, the people that are gonna be sitting with each other in the control rooms, you're essential. So how we fight together, how we are leaders together, and the mentorship we provide one another is what's gonna make us successful in our careers and in the battlefield. Attitude makes absolutely every, every difference in how we can do that. So the second reason I tell you the story about Margaret Corman is um, who hasn't heard we've come a long way? when we talk about women in military service. I swear to God, if I hear that one more time. Yes, we've come a long way. We've come a long way since Margaret Corbin, but we have so far to go that using that phrase, it reverberates around the halls of the Department of Defense. Using that phrase is a crutch. It's a, well, look how much we've done, not a look how far we have to go. I applaud the efforts of every single person who have gotten us this far, but that's the wrong phrase to use. It's about the attitude, and the attitude is, how can we continue to improve in every possible way? So if you wanna lead as a man or a woman, if you wanna earn the privilege of doing so, it comes from putting your energies and your pride and enthusiasms and your grit into that service. There's absolutely no doubt that every man in this, in this audience has faced challenges. There's absolutely no doubt that every woman in service in this room has faced those challenges and a heck of a lot more and will continue to face those. It takes the right attitude to get over those and it takes the right men by your side to be your leaders and your mentors and your friends and your peers to get us all through it. And I say attitude for a reason. I worked for um, a female officer at one point. She was a very high-ranking admiral. And she told me one day that she was an admiral because the Navy owed her that rank, because of what it had put, the Navy had put her through as she went up the ranks. The Navy didn't put her any through anything. The men around her might have, the women around her might have, society might have but you aren't owed anything by the Navy. You aren't owed anything by the people next to you. You need to earn it. You need to earn the respect. You're not given it because you're a woman. You're born a woman. Congratulations, you didn't earn that either. Now earn the rank and earn the respect and earn what the Navy offers you. You can, it, sky is absolutely the limit. A Space Force is, sky isn't the limit. It is the limit. Keep going and reaching for that. There's nothing past the sky. Um, so I want you to remember 
the doors open because there's doors that open because you're a woman, absolutely. There's doors that close because you're a woman. Take advantage of the open ones, run screaming through them, and knock really hard on the ones that are closed to see if you can get those open. And again, I, I can't emphasize enough how much we rely on and hope for the support of men around us. I did a tour um, in Saudi Arabia a couple of years ago, and I was at a panel much like this before I went, and it was on, um, I was an attache, I was a chief of attache operations out there, and so it was a panel held by high-ranking folks at, at DIA and, and in the military. Um, and, and encouraging us to go forward to our positions, whatever they were, and to, to do well um, by the Navy, by the country. And I approached one of the members of the panel afterward, and I thanked him for being there. It was a very interesting panel. And he said, oh, where are you, um, where are they sending you? And I said, oh, I'm going to Saudi Arabia. And he said, why the F would they send a woman there? So it took every bit of control I had to say why the F is an old man like you standing in front of a panel and still being out to pasture, but I didn't say that. <laughs> Instead, I thought, oh, watch this. And I went to Saudi Arabia, and it was the greatest tour of my career. It was absolutely fascinating. I'm the daughter of a Southern Baptist minister. I um, have read the Quran many times. I speak Arabic. I don't believe in anything most Muslim people believe in. I believe quite the opposite. And I loved their culture. I loved their interest in their religion. And they respected me for it. If someone tells you you can't do something, show them how and why you can. Be even better than you were at that thing. Man or woman, be even better than they thought you were gonna be able to be. And I have that gentleman to thank for inspiring me to go forward and do it. Now, the interesting thing is one of his fellow panel members heard him say that, another man, and he came up to me afterward and he said, you got this, you can do this. He didn't know if I was a complete nincompoop, but he came up to me anyway and said, you can do it, you're gonna be fine, you got it. Again, he had no idea, but at least he had the courage to come up and say, ignore that guy, you got it, and that's inspiring. You don't have to know someone. You don't have to know that they're wicked smart, as they say. Is this Boston? No? Okay. That they're really capable before you go up and try and inspire them. Pat them on the back and say one little sentence like that, and I have clearly have not forgotten that guy. He's um, quite an inspiration to me. So the last thing I want to go over is your confidence, ladies. I, was, um, I had the pleasure of being the Navy Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in Manhattan a couple of years ago. And we hosted about 45 to 50 young leaders from NATO nations um, at, a, at a round table on leadership. And it was just an open forum. You walked in the doors and you, you pick a seat. It was a rectangular table and you could pick anywhere you wanted to sit and there were about five or six chairs along the side. It was a full house. There were seven women in the audience and the rest were men, about 38 to 40 men. Five of the women automatically went to the side seats. They didn't even try and sit at the table. So if you don't have a seat at the table, why not? Why didn't you just walk up and sit there? Why didn't you have the confidence to say, I am a part of this group, I have something to contribute, listen and watch me. Don't self-select. There's plenty of people still out there who are selecting you for yourself. Don't limit yourself. You gotta go for it. You gotta sit at the table. We have to learn how to get out of our own way um, and have the confidence and the talent and the courage to face whatever the headwinds are that come against us. I really was inspired when we did the opening um, PowerPoints. So I'll close with this. Ask yourself the question that that Ukrainian officer asked herself, why not me? Ask yourself that, ladies. And gentlemen, ask yourselves, why not us? Why not all of us? And if you can recognize it isn't a culture that we have to blame, it isn't an, an old fashioned culture, it isn't our environment, it's you. It's every single one of us that we have to blame for what our culture is. So if you find your culture is wrong, look around you and find out who the man and the woman is that's sitting there making the culture that way. 
Don't blame an organization. Blame the humans that are running it and the humans that are standing beside you and try, try and figure out how to reach them and how to improve yourself so they're confident in you. And I think if we can say, how can I help and why not me and how, why not us, then we will have taken a step in the right direction. Now I'm done, I'm taking these off. <laughs> thank, thank you, Captain Abel. Um, that was wicked smart power. <laughs> I'm not very good at that. <laughs> but it also reminds me um, about, uh, I think, in my experience, I've seen a man and women have a different attitude to confidence um, and a different culture in their head, I guess. Um, if I apply for a job and I can fill three out of 10 a point in the job description, oh yeah, let's go for it. If you're a woman, I can only fulfill nine out of 10, I cannot apply for this. I've, I've heard that so many times that, you know, you're, uh, you're your own worst enemy sometimes because you need to take the challenge, so. And the next one on the, on the list is, uh, is how that in Peruvian Navy, uh, gender integration in maritime security operations. And uh, Admiral Carpio, Del Carpio, he's an alumni from the Naval Command College of 2015. Uh, he's a submariner. Um, and uh, now he's the director of the Peruvian Naval War College. So I will welcome you to take the floor. <clears throat> thank you very much, Admiral, for the introduction. At first, thank you very much, Admiral Garvin and Dr. Sarai Amin, for the kindly invitation. It's a pleasure to be back. Uh, last year, I had the pleasure to be here as moderator and panelist, and we met together. <laughs> so, uh, in this opportunity, I, I would like to present you how Peru includes gender integration in our Navy, but uh, as Krista mentioned, it's not uh, today's uh, history, because in Peru, for your information, in the northern part of Peru was a pre-Inca civilization. And that civilization that was in the coast was ruled by women. So that is the, the one interesting thing, that in that era, the woman rules the upper part of Peru. The second history uh, is about during the Pacific War, our army was marching defending the country. And behind the, the army was a group of women supporting husbands, brothers, and sons to support the fort to defend the country. So these both examples, uh, I think, that describes very good the, the important role of the woman in the defense and, and also the, the role of the woman in the society. So uh, 38 years ago, the Peruvian Navy began the effort to include women in the military. In the Navy, the first step was the conscripts. So we began to include and provide the opportunity to receive sailors. We still have conscripts in the Peruvian Navy. And after that, <coughs> was necessary to, to have officers. So we received uh, graduates from universities as survey officers. They spent one month in basic training at the Naval Academy and after complete the three months period of training, they became the first female officers, uh, service officers in the Peruvian Navy. And also, we in the, the same year, uh, we received women at the Petty Officer School. The next step was to prepare the Naval Academy. So I would like to highlight the support of the United States Naval Academy in that period of time because we sent a delegation and we received lessons learned, rules, norms that help us to create and modify regulations inside our Naval Academy 
and what and this was the result. The first class uh, you have uh, in the picture, the first female officers graduated from the Naval Academy. So right now we have about 17% of the women is part of the Navy in officers, petty officers, we have civilians. Most of the civilians are women, so I need to highlight also the role of the civilians. Behind the scenes and supporting the fleets, we have civilians. And you have in the picture the one officer is the captain and was the commanding officer of a ship in the Titicaca Lake and also the first uh, female cadet that uh, was in charge of the battalion at the Naval Academy a few years ago. Then I will show you two pictures. The first upper part, you will see the crew of a gunboat. And well, I don't know if you can see, but it's only one woman in the middle of the picture, the commanding officer. Commander Sandra Navarro works right now at the War College in Peru, but she was the commanding officer of a gunboat in the Amazon River. And she made some deployments in the, through the Amazon River and also the Putumayo River, that is the border between Colombia and Peru. And we are working with the Colombian Navy <coughs> against illicits and also against the reminders of terrorist groups. So it's important the presence of ships, of that type of ships in the jungle. So we have women not only in the Pacific Ocean, we have in the jungle and also in the Titicaca Lake. In the bottom part, you will see part of the group of women that participate in peacekeeping operations. So Peru has the commitment, the Peruvian government, to support a global defense. And that is the reason that every year we send troops around the world, mainly for Africa, IT, in order to help to preserve the global security. But in the last year, when I was here as moderator, one of the panelists was Major General O'Brien and she was in charge of the United Nations uh, peacekeeping operations in the world. And she highlighted the importance to have women on land, as Dr. Sarah Yamin also comment. But it's necessary to understand it's not only women, it's only, it's the woman must pass the training to be a blue helm. So it's an additional effort and a special training in order to participate effectively on land. So we have this effort in Peru, and every year we receive requests to add more women in that group of uh, support for the United Nations. Then, <clears throat> this is another example of a young woman in the Navy. Uh, Commander Bel Maria Belen Canales, she graduated from the Naval Academy. She was on board several different ships and directorates. She was the first female officer to be commanding officer of a base in the jungle. And she was the first woman to be the, the secretary, the deputy secretary of the Inter-American Naval Telecommunication Network in Mayport, Florida. So she represents Peru, two and a half years. Uh, sadly, we lost Maria Belén due to cancer last year. But she is a model to follow for young officers because she was bright, intelligent. Uh, she demonstrated leadership. She also receives uh, from Admiral Aiken posthumously a medal for the leadership. And I, I am sure that she will be the lighthouse for the future generation of young Peruvian uh, Navy officers. So, but we have also women in Antarctica. This is our Antarctic ship. The name is Carrasco, it's one of the mothers uh, technology, with technology. So we, 
we send the ship every year to Antarctica, and in the picture you will see all the females officers and petty officers on board the Antarctic ship. So that is also the effort to make research in that part of the globe. And here I have two pictures to show you. On the left side, I am in the middle at the War College in Peru. And both women are sisters. On the right side is a civilian. She works at the administrative office. On the left side, her sister is a lieutenant. He, she is studying the basic staff course. So that is the commitment of the woman not only in the military active duty, but also in the civilian side. And on the right side, all the cadets, female cadets, and the crew of the Naval Academy. So what is our commitment in order to promote gender integration? For example, we host every two years in Peru the Young Symposium. We invite uh, two or one uh, officers per country from the region. Last year, we invite for first time from Germany, Italy, and Netherlands. And every two years, we focus in women. So two years ago, we host that symposium. This is a picture of that symposium. We receive the female officers. We get on board. They participate in a sale two or three days talking about the, uh, the, their own experiences. And then we host a conference. So Dr. Sarai Amin participated as a speaker two years ago. Thank you for the participation and support. But this is a way to promote gender integration and also to join with different point of views. And this creates network for tomorrow. So these are seats for tomorrow. So that is the reason that we create these young symposiums to create a bond between young officers that will help together for global security in the future. So we were talking about uh, gender integration. So we have uh, different things that we need to emphasize our norms support because some women have children, so we have a sp a specific norms to support uh, the families. We have education, we have courses, we include gender integration topics, we host symposiums. Uh, one of the things that is very important, as Christian mentioned, is mentorship because you prepare the next generation. And last year, I also comment that why the United States Navy has, for example, 120 years in the submarine force, because one group of men was dedicated to prepare the next generation. Why Peru have 100 and some years of submarine force, because the generation prepares the next generation. So we need to prepare the people in that way. Also, we need to focus in the war military, but also to preserve and create a culture that will be better to make that integration possible. And from the beginning, so we need to start at the basic course at the Naval Academy and during the entire career. We are in Peru uh, improving more education and more training possibilities for women. For example, this year, two female officers are right now for first time in history at the summer in school. The next year, we will open the possibility to be Marines. So we are advancing more. We have right now only surface officers and pilots. So in the, in the future, we will provide more uh, possibilities for training and education. So, and, so and my last words is to 
get an applause to all the women that are in the military here in the room because you are very important for your nation and also for the global defense. For you. Thank you, Rear Admiral Adel Carpio. Um, what a wise words you came with. Uh, and, and I would just pick up on what you said, uh, that one generation has the responsibility to follow up the next generation for integration and education. And, and that is so important. And, and I think if any officer um, has the ambition to make the next generation even better than yourself, you are doing a good job and also changing the culture. So, so these are really, really uh, uh, brave initiatives that you are proposing today and, and we'll get back to certainly a lot of questions from you. So I will encourage you as you listen to these panelists that you formulate your questions so they are ready. But in the meantime, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Fabe. Uh, she's uh, a professor at the National Police College in Philippines. Uh, she's helped uh, write the Republic Act of uh, 11479, known as the Philippine Anti-Terrorist Act in 2020. She has written over 50 books, including Countering Terrorism and Crim Criminal Financing. And, and she, in preparation to this uh, symposium, had written a paper on enhancing Fem feminine power at sea, uh, the Filipino female Coast Guard officers patrolling territorial waters. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Fabi. Thank you very much, Rear Admiral Lars Saunes, distinguished participants of the Women, Peace, and Security uh, Conference. A pleasant good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Saira Yamin for her invitation for me to make this presentation. Following the lead of Captain Almonte, I would also like to start my presentation by reinforcing that men working with and supporting women makes for a stronger Philippine Coast Guard. I teach 10,000 public safety officers every semester and about 100 of them are our Coast Guard officers. I have talked to each and every female Coast Guard officer, and all of them told me that they had a supportive male mentor. I myself had a very supportive male mentor in maritime security, and it was the late Carlos Chuck Agustin the first Filipino graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. It was the late Chuck Agustin who told me that women have an important role in maritime security. And his words were prophetic because he reached out to me 15 years ago. I was a, a banker for Citibank and I shifted to maritime security. And all the female Coast Guard officers of the Philippines also have supportive male mentors. They have become officers because of the recommendation of their male, male mentors. Without men, there will be no women officers. And to the future leaders of uh, the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Department of Defense who are present here in this auditorium, your role is very important and strategic to allow women to go up the ranks. So the current leadership of the Philippine Coast Guard promotes gender equality and equity in all areas and in all levels. I remember when I started teaching in 2016 at the National Police College, out of 100 public safety officers, only two are female Coast Guard officers. Fast forward to 2019, out of 100 public safety officers, 
five are female Coast Guard officers. And then in the current year, 2024, out of 100 public safety officers, 20 are female Coast Guard officers. So as we can see, the trend of women officers is increasing. This is also because of the kind of leadership that we have in the Philippine Coast Guard. To support the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325, the Philippines had implemented laws to institutionalize gender mainstreaming in governance, including in the security sector. Republic Act 7192, which was passed in 1992, the Women in Development and Nation Building Act, the Magna Carta of Women Act of 2009, and the National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security from 2017 to 2022. So the Philippine Coast Guard supports the National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security in the five lines of effort in the strategy. The first is the meaningful participation of women. The second is the human rights protection of women. The third is the implementation of gender responsive policies on relief, response, and recovery. The fourth is the integration and institutionalization of women, peace, and security principles across Philippine Coast Guard programs and policies. The fifth is to strengthen capacity to improve gender equality through partnerships. So the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda of the Philippine Coast Guard has this acronym. Letter C represents consistency across all levels. Letter O reflects the organized and orderly step-by-step -step approach. Letter A refers to adaptability. When there is an indicator that WPS can be improved, then the leadership acts upon it. Letter S is strategic. It covers all areas where gender perspective matters the most. And letter T, time bound. There are targets linked to a deadline. Gender equality and gender equity is applied to recruitment and retention, rewards and recognition, compensation and benefits, training and career development, and policies and procedures. Currently, senior female Coast Guard officers are conducting gender advancement study to help Coast Guard officers who are young mothers to assist them in combining the demands of their career with family responsibilities, obligations, and expectations, such as child rearing, and achieving positive outcomes for their children. Another study is the gender awareness study on addressing stress in the workplace for female officers. And the third is a gender sensitivity study on infrastructure facilities and vessels of the Philippine Coast Guard, including base facilities, offshore assets and equipment to install gender inclusive design so as to promote a safe and productive work environment. We need to emphasize that these efforts remain on a continual basis. The gains that the Philippine Coast Guard had achieved so far needs to be further promoted. And last March 1, 2021, Commodore Luz Escarilla became one of the two female generals in Philippine Coast Guard history. In addition, the Philippine Coast Guard has adopted a gender and development focal point system that mainstreamed gender perspectives in policies and programs, created safe spaces 
for women personnel, and it has established the women's desk to handle cases of violence against women and children among its ranks. The Philippine Coast Guard also demonstrates the integration of women, peace, and security principles in operations at sea by providing medical personnel with gender sensitivity training, recruiting women as medical personnel, and utilizing the enhanced gender mainstream evaluation framework. The Philippine Coast Guard also promotes the equal opportunity for female Coast Guard officers to attend capa cap capacity building training in different parts of the world. And this training has enabled the development of a deep bench of female Coast Guard officers who are ready to take the lead in the future. The command also has a zero tolerance for sexual harassment and violence in the workplace. And there is a continuous gender and development training, gender and sexuality training, and anti-sexual harassment seminars being given in all of the different Coast Guard districts. In the face of Chinese maritime militia aggression in the South China Sea, the Philippine Coast Guard implements the national marine policy, which entails a proactive maritime administration that ensures effective implementation and enforcement of all laws and regulations. The national marine policy defines maritime security as a state in which the country's marine assets, maritime practices, territorial integrity, and coastal peace and order are protected, conserved, preserved, and enhanced. The Philippine Coast Guard also reinforces the 2016 arbitral ruling, applies sanctions against IUU fishing, and implements freedom of navigation in the Indo-Pacific. So what is the way forward? The Women, Peace, and Security Agenda of the Philippine Coast Guard focuses on participatory, equitable, empowering, and sustainable work environments across all levels. Specifically, it aims to do three things. First, to make possible to increase the number of female officers to 50% of the total officers, and to make possible the appointment of the first female commandant in the next five to seven years. Number two, to establish WPS mentorship program to encourage women to advance to officers' training, both in local and international levels. And the third is to establish a gender optimization study that will analyze all the skill sets of all Coast Guard officers and pave the way to ensuring access to advanced and specialized training. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Federer. Thank you so much. Um, I promise you an exciting uh, elective, and I would like you to uh, join me in thanking our panelists.